all for joining us. My name is Cindy Pankella, and I am the Director of Practice Management and Education at the American Osteopathic Association. We're very happy you could join us this evening. A few housekeeping rules. Um, you will get a copy of the, actually the slides are already up, um, and handout is, our, is available as well. The recording will be up by late tomorrow afternoon. Um, and those re that are listening in to get CME, you need to go back to the AOA online learning following the webinar. The post-evaluation is available at 8.15 Central Time this evening. You must take that, complete it, before you can get your CME. And now I will tell you a little bit about tonight's presentation. We're going to be talking about billing and coding under the new telehealth rules. And our speaker, again, is Jill Young. And Jill is a certified evaluation and management coder, a certified professional coder, a certified emergency department coder, a certified internal medicine coder, and the principal of Young Medical Consulting, LLC which is a company founded years ago to meet the education and compliance needs of physicians and their staff. Jill has, has over 35 years of medical experience working in all areas of the medical practice, including clinical, billing, and rounding with physicians. Her unique style of working with physicians is not only effective, but also helps bridge the gap between coders and physicians from a practical perspective. Her comments and opinions can be seen in several publications and also heard on a variety of audio conferences. Her background gives her a unique style of teaching using real life examples of coding and billing situations. We're thrilled to have her back with us again this evening, and I'll turn it over to her. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you so much, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your otherwise busy schedule. I don't know if you're, you're quarantined like we are in Michigan, but it was just extended, so we're, we're work, all working from home. But it doesn't stop us from learning. It doesn't stop us from doing our jobs, and one of the things that you're aware of and I'm acutely aware of is the difficulties that we have in trying to go through the huge amount of information that is coming out seemingly daily from our insurance carriers about how to bill and code um, for our telehealth telemedicine services. Now the information in this presentation is only as current as the research that I could do a couple of days ago um, and as you know things are fast changing I was on a, a call with CMS yesterday and a call today with WPS, our Medicare carrier here in Michigan, and I've actually added a couple of little pieces of information because of those calls. So again, things are just changing quickly. Um, so if you have a question, we'll do questions at the end. If your question is regarding a particular slide, don't be afraid to write that slide number down. Those slide numbers are in that upper left-hand corner. Um, so we could turn back to the slide if it's helpful for um, people to be able to do that. So um, one of the things that we'll all remember, I, I'm guessing, is the March 6th date. Um, but probably on a more practical note, you're going to hear and see the, um, the waiver 1135 phrase or reference to it. Um, that information from that waiver 1135 adjusted the Social Security Act, or the Act as we call it, those of us that are researching Medicare all the time know the Act and there are certain sections we all sort of have the numbers memorized for. But that waiver gave um, CMS authority to do some things, to do a bunch of waivers, to make changes in order to allow for um, a more streamlined caregiving for patients and other scenarios in the medical community. We, as I mentioned, we've seen daily changes from our insurance payers as the insurance payers are deciding what they're going to do in addition to CMS, um, who continues to release information and clarifying Q&As and having phone calls. Um, so don't be afraid to jump on those just to kind of get some information for yourself. Another term get used to seeing is that PHE, um, public health emergency. Everything 
from a CMS perspective is tied to that in most of our insurances that haven't set hard dates because they're saying this is good until the PHE is over or 30 days from when it's over or a reference in time for when it's over. So that public health emergency PHE macronym is important. Probably the biggest problem, and I've been talking about telehealth for a while now, is that the establishment in general uses the words telemedicine and telehealth interchangeably. And as we coders and billers look at rules, we hang on every word. We hang on a plural. We hang on that parenthetical S to tell us we need um, to handle this code differently. And to have two words used interchangeably is just asking for trouble. And I think now that we're in this environment, we are in trouble as we try to understand what we're doing. For me and how I remember is I use the reference at telemedicine as in a medicine doctor. That is the practice of using the technology. So that is the telemedicine service that um, most of us probably couldn't um, access because telemedicine was intended for patients in rural areas. Telehealth is more of the 30,000 foot view of healthcare through telecommunication technologies. And that supports a lot of different codes, not just the office visit codes um, and a few others that we're more used to with the telemedicine. Now, one of the biggest references that we have for all of this is this 1744 um, final rule that came in. And that is what really clarified for us coders and billers, a lot of the changes that we had to adjust to, both the technical changes in what goes on a claim form, but also from a compliance and a rules perspective, um, information that was changed. And pretty much the overall flavor is they're trying to relax as much as humanly possible in order to allow for our medical community to just take care of patients. Now that final rule, I have read all 221 pages of it. This is something that is my gift to you. This is Jill's little reference document so that there may be more information on additional pages. But if you're looking for information, for example, let me see if I get a little pointer here. If you're looking for information about federally qualified healthcare centers and rural health clinics, there's some information on 82 that you can go to. Um, you know, if you're looking for information about your MIPS data submission, that information is on at least page 130. It may be in other places, but at least it's there. And so you don't have to go crazy through so much of the information. So basically, this whole first, you know, 60, 80 pages is the information for most of the questions that I get. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to index this. And now that I have it as a document, why don't I just share it with you guys? make it easier for you to try to read through it when you're looking for answers to your questions. Now there is a listing of the telemedicine services that are allowed under the telemedicine concept of our doctors providing care and 80 additional codes have been added with the final rule. And those include um, all of these groups of codes that are added for during that PHE. If we look at telemedicine and look at the details of it, we really have two things to consider. There's the originating site, which is the location where the beneficiary is at. And that has always been the restrictive factor when it comes to providers providing services under the telemedicine concept. So these are patients that are in a rural HIPSA shortage area or in a county outside of that metropolitan statistical area and they are generally in, and I think it's on the next slide. No, they are generally in hospitals and other facilities. And so the physician that is going to provide care um, at that originating site, or provide care to the patient that's at, a, at an offsite, there is a portion of the Medicare payment that is going to go to that originating site because they're providing service. They're doing the vitals, their staff is preparing the patient, whatever. And so there is, and there is still in existence, this code for billing for that site fee. And it's like a facility fee. Um, so the doctor for that 99213 
gets less money because he doesn't have that expense that the originating site fee did. Now, the originating site was waived with our 1135 waiver. Now, what that meant is now the patient can be at any location. They can be at home, they can be in the nursing home, they can be in their daughter's home. It does not matter. The whole point of the waiver is to keep the patients where they are and to have the physicians provide services to the patients so that they don't have to go out and have exposure. So the biggest waiver they made was waiving that originating site. We have the other piece of it is the distance site practitioners, and that's where our physicians and nurse practitioners that are providing the service, usually in their offices. And so we have doctors in one location and the patients in another location. And that's the whole kind of concept of the telemedicine. So prior, and this is for the telemedicine services that are on the list. And that's all I'm talking about is the ones that are on the Medicare list. So prior to the public health emergency, we had the originating site, the distant provider, we used place of service O2 and no modifier. And that's what a lot of us did when we first found out that they had um, discontinued the originating site restrictions. Then we found out, oh boy, we should have been billing it with, we don't have any restrictions on the originating sites. We don't really have any changes in the providers that are eligible to provide the service. But they said, oh, by the way, if you build the place of service O2, we're going to pay you, you know, that discounted facility fee because we were expecting to pay at the originating site some money. And so for those of you that sent those bills in, as we all thought we were doing the right thing, with that O2 place of service and no modifier, you received about $12 less for that 99213. So now, after March 1st, we found out, okay, they're telling us to build the place of service that your provider would usually bill for that code or service had they been performing it normally, um, and then use the modifier 95 to indicate that this is under the real-time interactive audio video, tele audio video telecommunication system. So in other words, indicate that it's telemedicine. Now, um, as we look at that slide, make sure you see the difference and it's okay if you did it wrong. We have a little remedy for that that we just found out about. But the reason you're not gonna build the telehealth O2 place of service is because that automatically from Medicare only, um, I'm talking Medicare, that automatically reduces the fee that your physician will get. But we do need to reflect that we are doing it via telemedicine and so that's why we're using the 95 modifier. And those are the instructions that we've had for at least a week and a half now. <laughs> so hopefully that's not changing. It, it makes logical sense. I don't think, you know, as we, as the politicians and the people that write the, the, the policies um, didn't think about the inner workings of what that would have meant with that place of service. Now, if there are other services that we're going to talk about, um, or if we look at, other codes that aren't on the list, how do we bill those? Well, if they're not specific telehealth services, then we just bill them the way we normally would, again, to Medicare. But then anybody else, we have to look at the carrier instructions, and the carrier instructions are all over the place. They are just really all over the place. So whether they want a modifier or not, whether they want a different place of service or not, they're um, not giving us necessarily instructions. We have some insurances that say we'll follow Medicare rules um, for this, but then when you go to bill it, they have their own way of doing it. So basically, we're all gonna be in, a, in an environment where we're gonna end up with a grid of information for the payers that you're working with. Now, um, I'm trying to get a grid put together myself, but as we look at where are we, basically, we're, let's go back and start talking about the telemedicine services the ones that are on the list, and I know the slides say telehealth and telemedicine interchangeably, but that's unfortunately the way Medicare refers to them. Our telemedicine modifier that we use, that 95 that I already mentioned, that's saying, okay, we're using that synchronous audio-visual telecommunications. The GT modifier was the modifier we used to use for telemedicine services, but when the place of service O2 was introduced, Medicare stopped using this. 
but there are still some situations as you can read on the slide that that is supposed to be used, not normally in a physician office, but rather in that critical access hospital in certain situations. There are a couple of disaster um, related modifiers and CMS specifically for the claims that providers are filing has said we do not want those modifiers, do not need those modifiers um, added to claims for physician HECFA 1500 claims. And then the other two modifiers you might hear about, there's the G0 modifier, which is a modifier used to identify services that they're looking at, the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of symptoms of an acute stroke. And then the GQ modifier, and I only mention it to tell you, don't even think about it, unless you're in Alaska or Hawaii. Um, for them, they have some additional allowances. They are allowed to do asynchronous telehealth, meaning not real-time audio video, but that's because they're part of a different project because I'm assuming because of their distances. So Alaska and Hawaii are the only states that are using the GQ modifier. So as we look at what kinds of things have changed with the waiver and the other acts and things that have been put into place, new patients are allowed. Now, most of the services that we talk about will talk about established patients, but they are opening up the gates and saying, no, we're going to allow new patients. Now, they're not giving us permission to do new patients, but rather they're using the phrase, they will not conduct audits to ensure that that relationship doesn't exist. Now you'll see I have two dates in that red ink over here, and that's because the original information we had that it was effective 3-6, but when the final rule came out, it said everything is effective on 3-1. So in the final rule, they went to great pains to indicate that when we're talking about these types of telemedicine services that are on the list, that they are done under the, under the conditions of this audiovisual equipment permitting two-way real-time interactive um, communication between the patient and the provider. So we have to have both audio and visual. Again, this is for Medicare and this is for the codes that are on the list. Now, they have loosened up to allow our providers more flexibility, again, trying to get make it easier for them to take care of their patients. And I'm just gonna jump ahead a slide because they are allowing all of these programs that previously or platforms that were not acceptable um, to be used in order to facilitate that two-way communication audiovisual. So if you're gonna do Skype or FaceTime or Snapchat or any program that allows for the audiovisual, and I'm gonna go back, as long as it's what's called a non-public facing platform, meaning it's not intended for other people to share into your conversation, then those are the ones that are okay. Apparently the ones, and again, I've never heard of these until now, the ones, um, where would it go, TikTok and Twitch, um, those apparently are public facing platforms, so those are not allowed. Sorry, getting a little too click happy here. So the other thing that non-public facing makes me want to say is also be sure your providers are being um, diligent as diligent as they can be to say don't have you know two providers whose desks are back to back both on the phones talking to patients via FaceTime where in essence the patients can see each other because that's a violation of HIPAA or the bleed over of conversations that's another violation so just use some common sense go into a patient room make sure they're backward facing um, you know, use a headset if, if that's a, you know, help to the bleed over in the conversation, whatever it is that they need to do so that they are as compliant as they can with HIPAA. Again, they're being very careful in saying they're exercising enforcement discretion um, with, with regard to HIPAA rules because there are a lot of HIPAA rules that are going to be um, gone by the wayside in an effort to take care of patients and for the greater good. But when you can use common sense in the office when your provider is doing conversations with patients um, so that they're not walking around the office talking to Mrs. Smith on the phone, that's probably not a really good idea. Um, let's see. Patients consent 
Um, some codes require consent and some codes do not. Some codes have consent once a year, some codes have consent every time. My personal suggestion when we have varying levels of something is to go to the most stringent and just make that the policy. And I do recommend when it comes to any um, office that's going to do telemedicine, telehealth services, that you do have policies for things so that there's a consistency in what you do. And there's a consistency if there's ever a question of what you're doing um, or why you did things a certain way, just so that you have it down in writing. So my suggestion is that you just get consent every time. Now, the good news is that in the final rule, they said that your ancillary or auxiliary staff could take that consent, get that consent from the patient, and enter it into the record. So that is something that your staff could do for you. Um, and the question, what needs to be in consent? There are consent documents that you can find on the internet for when we needed written consent, but we now are allowed verbal. Um, the written consent forms sometimes have stuff that I just think is, in my opinion, is over the top. You know, what is, what is consent? And there's nothing that I could find in my research that defines what the consent is. So let's use common sense. You know, we're consenting to an audiovisual office visit that they know that there's liability for them and that we're doing the best job we can to keep our HIPAA rights of our patients um, monitored appropriately. I, I can't find anything that says what you should or shouldn't do. So I think common sense and a policy in place for what you'll ask every patient is probably your best advice. The patient's financial liability, the, um, the waiver 1135 allowed for doctor's offices to waive liability without getting in trouble. We all know professional courtesy has gone out the window but in this instance, they are saying that they can waive liability. Now, my suggestion is, if your provider is going to do this, ask them to be very careful in the words they use and say, we'll accept what your insurance pays. Because if they have a secondary, um, they're gonna be able to collect that money and, and again, help the patient with their out of pocket, but don't short yourself by saying, I'll just take what Medicare pays. And then while we're on the subject of, of that, um, HHS has said they won't take enforcement. Again, they're not going to give permission, but rather say we're just not going to enforce. You know, we have a lot of us have um, large deductibles and have deductible coverage that we have to fulfill before benefits kick in with a lot of instances for a lot of the care that we're seeing either directly for COVID-19 or for our telemedicine services. Anybody that's waiving copays and deductibles prior to satisfaction of that legally um, charged deductible, that's okay. They're not going to um, come after people for uh, violating that part of the HHS rules. So for telemedicine, the codes that are on that list for Medicare, they tell us to report the place of service that would have been reported had the service been furnished in person. So that means if it's done in the office, you're going to report your place of service 11. Um, and this is during that public health emergency. If you're in a provider-based billing scenario, you would use, what do you use, a 22, I think, whatever you guys use. So wherever you would normally report that service, um, your notation that it's a telemedicine service is that 95 modifier. And again, that allows for Medicare to make appropriate payment to you um, without taking that discounting that we saw if we use a place of service O2. And that just says what we've already said. So now what is your provider looking to document? Well, I sort of used the example of a, a 213 and maybe a 214 because that's what we see most commonly. Um, these are patients, if um, we're talking Medicare age patients, most of them do have um, more than one thing was wrong with them. They have comorbidities in addition to multiple illnesses. So you can use time for your service, your traditional time based on the 95 guidelines or the 97. I'm just a 95 um, friendly person. But always remember, you still have to have medical necessity. You cannot forget having medical necessity when you're um, doing your documentation. And if it's a telemedicine service or any other um, virtual kind of service, 
how are you talking to the patient? Who's on the line? Um, you know, what's the methodology of what you're doing, just so it's in the record. Now, the other thing from a documentation perspective that the providers can use, and this was in the final rule, is that they can kind of get ahead of themselves and use the some of the policies for documentation that we're going to see come in 2021. So they can do based on medical decision making, where they're going to only do as much of a history and exam as is clinically appropriate. They don't have to document it necessarily. And then they use the medical decision making. Now, the 2021 rules have a new table of risk, but they are saying, no, we can use the table of risk that our providers are used to. So that's one concept that they can use. The other concept that they can use is the concept of time, and that's the new time. Time is defined in 2021. So time as defined in 2021 is the total time of the visit, including non-face-to-face -face time. So from the minute your provider sits down and is looking at the chart before he picks up the phone to call Mrs. Smith, that time counts. Now you'll see that this grid, which is not in the handout, and I apologize, I didn't think to put it in the handout until after, um, these are the times for 2021. So if your provider is going to use what we call the new time, the total time that he's involved with this encounter with this patient, then you'll see the times have actually gone up some. So your 99213, which according to the 1995 guidelines is a 15 minute code, that's now a 20 to 29 minute code. So the times have gone up. And again, this information is um, not in your handouts and I apologize but it is available in several different places. And the times for the new patients is the same. So there's two new methodologies the providers can use when it comes to looking at what they're gonna document. From a supervision perspective, and we're kind of hitting on all these different topics that were in the final rule, they're basically saying that in, in the interest of everybody involved, and keeping um, contamination down and allowing doctors to do as much as they possibly can, if we have real-time audiovisual communications, then that can count as supervision. Now on the call today with um, WPS, the Medicare carrier for Michigan, they said when it comes to doing supervision for your auxiliary and ancillary staff, such as doing a shot that the doctor is supposed supposed to be on the phone when they're doing the shot. Now that was verbally spoken. That's not necessarily what we're seeing, but it's something, again, we're gonna to have to get that clarified a little. The question is, it says the use of this real-time technology um, to observe the patient interacting counts, but does it have to be happening or does it just have to be available? And that's the question um, that we're waiting to have answered. What diagnoses are allowed? Um, telehealth, telemedicine services are for any diagnosis, and you don't have to have COVID-19 anywhere on that claim form, anywhere in the record. They are saying keep these patients at home. If they have an earache, let the doctor call them. If they have a sore throat, let the doctor call them. If they have a fever, let the doctor call them. Um, so it's for any diagnosis at all. And the example that they specifically use is a patient that needs to see the physician in order to get a refill for medication. Now, again, the documentation still has to show the medical necessity that it's reasonable and necessary to provide the service to the patient. But I think it's important to note, again, this is for any service. I'm sorry, for any diagnosis, my apologies. So let's look at the diagnoses. We finally have all the information I think we need. We have a new code that was effective April 1st. And it's, this was a code that was fast tracked through the CDC process to get out by April 1st. I listened to part of the committee meeting, committee meeting minutes 
And it sounds like, you know, when they talk about they moved a mountain, well, it sounds like they moved a couple of mountains to get this code through so that we have a code. So the code is U07.1. Now this is in a series of codes that are codes for special purposes. And the intent that I got in the conversation was that this code will eventually be moved over to B, the B section, which is where all the other virus codes are. But for right now, this is what the code is and this is what we're to use. The instructions, so ICD-10 guidelines are the guidelines that everyone has to use, and they're the guidelines that tell us how to use this code. And that's where you can find the guidelines. And honestly, if you just go to, if you type in your, your Google or Bing, you know, um, CDC and ICD-10, it'll take you right there. So it tells us in this final rule in the guidelines section, that we're only going to code confirmed cases, but remember we have two ways that a case is considered uh, uh, confirmed. We have the documentation that the provider says the patient has it, I have a positive test result, and our job isn't to go out and look for that test result. Our job is to simply say the doctor says they have it, that's good enough. Or what's called a presumptive positive, where we have one test has been positive, but there's a secondary test that has to be done it's not yet been done, but they're going with the positive of the first. They're, they're saying, okay, it's not officially confirmed, but it's a presumptive positive. And those are coded as um, confirmed or as a positive test. So whenever we have the, um, a situation where the COVID-19 meets that definition of the principal diagnosis, then it's always sequenced first, and then it's followed by the appropriate codes for other manifestations, it, with the exception of um, some obstetrical patients. So that direction is different, both because we didn't have the U code, um, but also different in sequencing from what we were told in some preliminary uh, paperwork that the CDC released. So what I did was put them side by side so that you can have this at your desk and say, okay, what's the data service of the patient? And so what codes am I going to use? From a technical perspective, my concern is how quickly these codes are gonna get loaded on the systems of our carriers. So, you know, you might wanna not send 200 claims through, you might wanna float a few through um, with dates of service after April 1st to see if they've loaded that U07.1 code in. But if you look at the code here for pneumonia, so you have a patient that's confirm confirmed as having a pneumonia due to the COVID-19, if it's, before April 1st, we code the pneumonia first and a code for the virus second. After April 1st, we code the virus first and the pneumonia second, so that's opposite. So what I did was for the two documents that had been released, I took the information and put them side by side for each of the scenarios that they gave to us for these patients. So whether it's a bronchitis, a lower respiratory infection, whether the patient is going into ARDS, whether they've had exposure, um, all of these scenarios I tried to spell out so that you could have this as a, an aid at your desk. Now, there were scenarios that were not covered in the original document for screening, and those were covered for after April 1st. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying you don't have anything to do. I'm just saying they were not in those official documents. And so therefore I did not put them into my sort of grid here. For signs and symptoms, if we have a patient that presents with signs and symptoms and we don't meet any of the other qualifier conditions that would allow us to use extra codes, then we bill signs and symptoms. That's no different than what we do every day when a patient comes in with a cough and the doctor thinks it's a pneumonia, but he's not sure. So we code it as a cough. And there are the um, circumstances if we have a patient that's pregnant. And then as a reminder, we all know we don't code rule out diagnoses, but doctors have gotten very creative because they now use words like suspected or probable or most likely, or I've had a few I'm pretty sure or looks like. Um, if it's not a definite yes, then it's not a positive. It's not something that we're going to code.
looking at the telemedicine codes that are on the list that are for hospital care, previously there were restrictions in frequency. Those have all been waived. Electronic prescriptions. There were DEA registered practitioners. There were certain restrictions that they had in order to give prescriptions to patients, and those um, have been altered. And so if you have a scenario where all of the following conditions are met, then it is allowed for our DEA registered practitioners to issue scheduled substances to patients for whom they have not conducted that in-person evaluation, which is previously required. And then some of the other technicalities of that waiver. For licensure, the 1135 waiver is allowing that providers that are licensed in their home state but are providing telemedicine services for a patient in another state, that that is now allowed under Medicare. Now, that doesn't waive it and, okay, let's just do it. It just means from a Medicare perspective, that restriction has been lifted. We still have to look and see, does that um, other state allow for the doctor to provide the service? And so there is still certainly um, some um, due diligence questioning that has to happen. And that reminds me, don't forget to check with your malpractice too. Um, my understanding is some policies have it, some policies it's a waiver that's not very expensive, but the bottom line is make sure that you have telemedicine services um, in your malpractice for your doctors. So under licensure, um, again, just finishing out, sorry, I got sidetracked on the other thing. Um, licensure is, we have to be sure all of these conditions are met in order for that provider to be able to provide telemedicine services to a patient that is out of state. Regarding provider enrollment in an effort to get providers um, ready to see patients, if you will, and bill for patients as quickly as possible, they've established these um, fast tracking hotlines for um, offices or entities to call in in order to try to uh, get billing privileges for Medicare for our physicians and non-physician practitioners. What they're doing is they're waiving some of the screening requirements that are normally in place. And basically, this fast tracking process, and, and I'm talking fast tracking process, um, unless you're looking at these kinds of providers, um, let me get to the next slide, they're going to ask information on the phone, such as this. There may be more information, but this is what they had on the list in the, um, the release information. And then while you're on the phone, they will give you the yes or no that this provider has temporary billing privileges. So if you talk about fast tracking privileging, you think about those of us that have ever done credentialing, they're going to do it over the phone. So you're going to start the conversation, and by the time you get off the phone, the probability that you've gotten approval for that provider um, to have a temporary billing, billing privileges for Medicare is just astonishing to me. Now, when the emergency is lifted, when the, um, the PAT is gone, then if they want to continue, they're going to have to submit an enrollment application under normal circumstances. But this is clearly, this fast tracking is, um, is it's a great thing. Again, there are different providers, um, different types of providers that they're not going to be able to do this for everybody, but they are trying to the best of their abilities to fast track everything in a very quick time frame. We've got seven and 14 days that we see there. Now, the next couple of slides have information regarding telemedicine and HIPAA. And I'm not going to read it all because I realized it made me kind of depressed thinking of these scenarios. But suffice to say, that healthcare providers are going to share PHI or our protected health information with anyone in order to prevent or lessen a serious or imminent threat to the public health and safety. So it's a, if it's important for somebody to know or someone to be asking questions about someone's PHI, then the HIPAA police, if you will, are going to turn a blind eye to that. If it's important for that patient's care, or for the greater good, um, HIPAA's kind of going to go by the wayside a little bit. And I don't think that that's a bad thing, but um, all of these had to be 
listed in a waiver or listed on some of the um, other legislation that went through um, making all these changes. So all of that is Medicare and our telemedicine codes. And as we say in the business for in many different scenarios and for anybody that follows Medicare rules. So remember, probably the most important things you should have on your computer is you should download that list of telemedicine codes making sure you use that link and that you've got the 80 new codes that are covered. Um, you want to make sure you've got a copy of the final rule, and I think we included that. You print out that index so that you can um, easily find things if you want to reference it. And so you can look at those services and say, okay, here's what I'm going to bill for place of service. Here's what I'm going to bill with a modifier. Here's what I'm going to do for those. But what about the other care codes that we have? Okay. Now, any of our telemedicine codes, telehealth codes that we're going to talk about that have time, remembering that this is an, an E&M kind of time, so we have to meet or exceed the time of the code. So if the code says five to ten minutes, the provider has to get to at least five minutes to satisfy the time requirement of the code, and we need that to be in the documentation. So and if any of these codes that are time-based meet the lowest threshold of that code and document as such. So I took and said, okay, I'm going to try to make this easier, and I hope it does, and you'll have to tell me if it does or doesn't. So we have our electronic codes, where our online digital codes, where we're working through the computer, so to speak. We have our telephone only, and then we have our AV real-time telecommunication, which is our telemedicine codes that we've already talked about. We have codes that have little asterisks that say, okay, this is for a qualified healthcare professional that doesn't have the clinical aspects of their licensing, and so they're using different codes than our providers are. And then we have our G2010, which is our store and forward code, which has multiple options for how the patient follow-up occurs. So that's why it has its own little symbol. But, but the bottom line is these are the codes that we have available for use by all of our carriers. So if we look at electronic, we can look at our online digital evaluation and management. Now this is seven days of cumulative time. So if the patient sends the doctor an email, from the minute the doctor opens the email up, okay, I just spent two and a half minutes. Write that in the chart, what did you do? Um, now, the services are called evaluation and management services, and so we want to be sure that the documentation has elements, if you will, that sort of show that we have work done in that evaluation and management thought process. So we would want to perhaps see, and again, these are this is clinical, so this is the doctor's world, but you know something that shows that here's what was wrong with the patient, here was our interaction, here's what I did. Or again, it may be over several days that we see the, the compiling of all of those notes to be able to see what the service was. Because again, this is cumulative time over seven days. Now, patient initiated, that's a phrase that we got hung up on for a while. But basically on one of the CMS calls, they said, what we don't want is providers calling patients to initiate appointments. So whether this is the patient contacting you because they have a question, or this is the only contact the patient can make with you, um, they're gonna miss their appointment. As long as it's not what they called cold calls, then they're okay with it. So this is the cumulative time over the seven day period. This is one of the codes that requires verbal consent that needed to be documented annually. But again, you know, let's go to the most restrictive requirement of consent. So my suggestion, Jill's suggestion, is to just document consent each time. And then these codes say specifically not for non-evaluative electronic communication of test results. I've had a lot of questions about, well, what do I do if the doctor just calls to give the patient their test results? That's not an E&M service, that's just a quick phone call. 
And so unfortunately, that does not meet this threshold. Also not for scheduling or an appointment, and it says that does not include an E&M. This information is from the guidelines that are found right before the codes in your CPT book. And as we see with all of these codes, clinical staff time is not included. So um, anything that your staff is doing with regard to the service is just part of it, just part of it. So for our qualified non-physician, as I mentioned, we have ones that do not have that E&M possibility in their scope. So these are G-codes because Medicare didn't like the word evaluation and management. They like the word assessment because, again, these, pay, these providers don't have clinical. Again, cumulative time for up to seven days or a total of seven days, sorry. And the codes mirror each other in their language, their restrictions, and in their timer for the codes. So Medicare uses the G codes and then the exact same CPT code. Again, there's the word evaluation that Medicare doesn't like. So these codes, the 98970 series and the G series are exactly the same. The difference is Medicare wants their G codes. Here's the store and forward service where a patient is going to send to the doctor a video or images, and then we're gonna have follow-up with the patient that could be a phone call, it could be many different things according to the guidelines of the codes. These are services that are not supposed to be related to an E&M that's happened within the previous seven days, nor to an, a procedure or a visit within the next 24 hours or the soonest available appointment. We're going to see that language, um, the um, seven, seven days prior and the within 24 hours, we're gonna see that in a lot of the call, uh, a lot of the codes that we're gonna talk about, the telephone codes. That is a consistency that they have. So for the store and forward, there's a code that needs verbal consent. Clinical staff time doesn't count. This is not a telehealth code, so it doesn't have any of its restrictions, nor does that mean we're looking at place of service from a Medicare perspective, nor does, are we looking at place of service O2 for this. This is just a regular code that we would use. So now, again, as I just said, as we go into these telephone codes, we see this language not originating and leading, not leading to an E&M service. There's the information that we just got about no call calls, and here in the CMS news release was the only reference that we found to what does it mean initiated by patient. So let me just stop there for a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. If we talk about you have a patient that has an appointment and you contact the patient in order to say, we're offering telehealth services, can we do that? That's okay. The patient has a problem because they have an appointment scheduled and you're just um, facilitating putting the parties together to provide the service. Um, if a patient you know, calls your office with a problem, that one's easy. But this is just to prevent, the language they're saying was meant to prevent providers from making what they are calling cold calls. So now here's our face-to-face -face service, I'm sorry, non-face-to-face -face service over the telephone for our physicians or other qualified healthcare professional. There's the restrictors, the seven days and the 24 hours, as I call it. There's your time element. So the question everybody's asking is, what's the difference between the G, um, G1012, shoot, hold on. My numbers are getting in my head too much. No, nope. the G01, G2012, oh boy, I have too many numbers. I'll wait till I get there, sorry. This and the G code, um, it, there isn't really any difference there on um, that G, that other G code for the telephone call. 
that quickie phone call is um, a five to 10 minute code as well. Medicare had not previously allowed these. They're not showing on the fee schedule um, as payable. That's something that has to be corrected. Um, but from what we can see from other sources, the payment for this um, code, for this level code right here, the 99442 is about half of a 99213. So the payment is substantially less than we would get for doing telemedicine. So again, these are non-face-to-face -face services. Um, a patient has to be established. I've tried to cross out. Every time I do this, I find another place where I've missed one because new patients are in fact allowed. Here are the codes for the um, qualified non-physician. And the example that CPT uses is like a PT, OT, speech language. And then there's our virtual check-in, thank you. That was the code I was looking for. So this has that five to 10 minutes of medical discussion. So this says brief communication technology-based service. If we go backwards and look at this, this is an evaluation and management service. So I guess you could say the difference is that, that this is a more formal service than perhaps that one is. But frankly, the codes look pretty darn similar and it appears the payments are pretty darn similar too. So, and that's all the information we have on that virtual check-in, just to get those out there. So what are our payers doing? Well, I've already alluded a few times that they've got a whole lot of different stuff that they do. For example, in the state of Michigan, um, Michigan Medicaid, very quickly said, okay, you know what, we're going to expand our access to allow beneficiaries to receive services in their home. So they said, okay, in the home works. And then they released this that says for all of the codes that are in their telemedicine database, in their telemedicine database, telephone only can be used. And this was released in March. So early on, Michigan Medicaid called that we could do that service that inherently is defined as an audiovisual service, we could do it with just audio. For our federally qualified healthcare centers and rural health clinics, there's um, a lot of things that had to happen, but the final rule allows them to act as a distant site. But um, today on one of the calls I was on, they said, but we don't have any instructions on how to build their services yet. The final rule says they can do it, we just don't have the um, instructions on what exactly can happen. So they're still working on that. So if you haven't found that and you're a federally qualified healthcare center, you're not crazy. It's just not out there yet. Our Medicare Advantage plans, um, certainly CMS has said, you know, if you want to, we'd love for you to follow what we're doing, but they don't have to. But a lot of the products, if you look online, they will list commercial and Advantage plans are doing it this way. So um, again, in that research that you need to do, don't forget to ask about Medicare Advantage plans. So if we look at what information's out there, and, and I know many of you have never really done research, but certainly if I go to the Aetna website and type in the search box, telehealth or telemedicine, I'm gonna have a bunch of stuff come up. Now, please be fair to the insurances. They're still trying to figure this out in some instances. So what may not have been there yesterday may be there tomorrow. Um, this was released relatively quickly. Notice that Aetna has beginning March 6th and ending June 4th. They're telling us to use either of the modifiers. Reimbursement will be made for two-way real-time AV communication between the patient and the healthcare practitioner. So they're sort of defining out what they're doing. And then they release this document the second week saying, okay, here's more, and in essence, more technical information. And this is, you know, I don't have provider sign-ins like you do. This is just straight off of Google and Bing, you know, saying Aetna Telemedicine Telehealth or going to their website and looking in the search box. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan has a whole lot of stuff out there, 
But then they say this, we've aligned our requirements with Medicare. And Medicare says it has to be, or CMS says it has to be audiovisual. Now, if I go to, um, oh, I don't want to do that one yet. If I go to Texas, Texas says, um, nope, we can do it differently. Let's see, where is it? Um, Please note that on a temporary basis in response to COVID-19, audio only consultations will be covered when provided in accordance with applicable regulations and rules. So they're saying for consults are waiving it. Do we ask about all the rest um, of services? So if you lived in Texas, there's that for you. Now let me come back to this. We Cross with Shield, this, I just got a copy of this yesterday. They've color coded out this grid to say, okay, if the if the code is what we're calling clear or white, then bill place of service O2 and the modifier, and that'll waive cost sharing, da da da, and it's all right. For these codes, we don't need a telehealth place of service, nor do we need a modifier. Um, just bill it regular. All right. For these orangey codes, and those are those you know, store and forward and um, check, virtual check-in. Okay, here's what we do. We don't need a place of service special or a mod. So they've done a good job at that, um, listing them out and color coding them. So that just came out from that one insurance. So some resources for you. Here's the CPT definition of the codes, um, often AMA uh, website information. Um, these are from the 2020 fee schedule. So these are the current RVUs and the status codes in the fee schedule that was out. Just to give you a rough idea. So remember I said on the G2012, so here's a 99213 that pays 211 and the rough equivalent of that service um, it's a whole lot less money. It's a whole lot less money. Or if we look and try to um, compare it to um, another code, it just allows you to do that so that you can look at your business model for what you have to. These are the telephone codes that previously had not been paid by Medicare um, and are now payable. And there's our digital visits. Other resources, this Center for Connected Health Policy, the information that they have on this website is phenomenal and they are keeping it up to date as far as I can tell. Um, it's a great resource. This document was great. Um, I've not been on the website this week. I'm embarrassed to say because I've been so busy. Um, hopefully they've come up with a new one because this document was phenomenal. It was a step-by-step, -step, very um, user-friendly document about billing for encounters. There's also this um, national consortium of telehealth resource centers and they're regionally defined. So of course I pick my region and then here's one of their face pages. And then down here is more information. There was a whole screen. You can see there's like five different screens that are scrolling of information, telehealth resources, telehealth in the news, COVID resources. So lots of good information out there. Also on CMS's website, they have an emerg current emergency website. And this is where all the press releases and other documents are. So here's the top of the page and see this is CMS, Emergency Preparedness, Current Emergencies. If you can get to this web page and get to this right here where it says get waiver and flexibility information. Okay, remember that because I got to show you the other half of the page. All these documents and they have them dated so we knew when they came out. So when I was doing research, we could figure it out. But if we go to that other waiver page, look what we have. We have releases for physicians, ambulances, and here we go, teaching hospitals, teaching physicians and medical residents, long-term health facilities, nursing facilities. So specific resources um, for those specific entities. So just trying to give you a wealth of information for where you can go to look stuff up. Um, Two things happened on the CMS call yesterday, and neither of them are official. Um, and 
I only mention them in order to allow you to do the best you can for your practice. They talked about they still had some, and, and I can't, I, they must have used the word power, power left in the 1135 waiver. And they, the people on the phone said this after someone said, well, what do, you, what do I do if my doctor's trying to call old Granny Smith, who's 90 years old and has a flip phone and doesn't have a computer or internet access? How is he supposed to provide the service for his patient and allow our doctors to, to bill and get reimbursed at a level they can keep their practice open? And she said, well, we still have some power left to make some changes and just, you know, please stand by and wait. She didn't say they were going to do anything. She just sort of cracked the door open that they're not done making changes was the impression that I got. So if there's any way for you to hold your claim forms where your doctor is performing a service that he tried to do audiovisual, but the visual is not possible. He only did the audio. He documented it as if it was a telemedicine visit, it, the bullet points of a 99213 and 99214 are there. If you could hold those claims for another week or two, I have a feeling we might get some more information that might be advantageous to us. I don't know. I just have a feeling in the way she said it. The other thing is, you remember the phrases for the telephone calls not related to an e &M service within the prior seven days? Um, they said on the phone that they're not, quote, not really enforcing that that telephone calls are just telephone calls. We're gonna to wait to see that in writing too. So if you can hold on to those claims until we can get clarification, or if they come out with the transcript, a tight transcript that is a, a CMS person saying, we're not really enforcing this thing, that's good enough for me to go ahead and build the service even though it doesn't meet the requirement because I've got something in writing that says that they've adjusted the rules a little bit. Um, and again, those are just comments from if anybody else is on the call, let me know if you heard different. Um, also, there's a transcript of the call and uh, replays of the call that are usually available within about a week online. All right, and now we're going to have Cynthia come in and what is this? Oh, sorry, one last thing I lied. Um, this is not in your handouts and this is if you build with the place of service O2 and you received a reduction in payment, um, you need to do a clerical error reopening, which is something you can do apparently on the appeal section of your MAC website and go into the claim and change the place of service and add the modifier in order to get the additional funds that you were um, not given at um, the initial payment. And um, Cynthia, probably what we should do is make available a corrected copy of this lecture because I've added those couple of things and especially this is really, really important to me. And now I think, there we go. Now we're onto your slides. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to talk, while we're waiting for any more questions to be typed in, I wanted to go over some of the resources that the AOA has for you. So if you could do, click the next slide. Jill, there we go. So we have our COVID-19 resources page. This page gets changed regularly, as Jill um, mentioned, you know, these things are happening quickly. Um, so just because you went to it, maybe when this first started, you know, a few weeks ago, doesn't mean it hasn't been changed there, especially with the, the, what the different billers are doing. We also have the AOA webinars. That's where they are all, the AOA, AOIA ones are located. Um, you'll be able to go back. If you missed Jill's previous lecture, you can go back and register for that. We had some other ones um, this week as well. So that's where you can find all of that. And then the next uh, slide, Jill. And then we also have um, developed relationships with two companies that are offering um, telemedicine platforms. If you have not yet started or you're not sure what, if you like the one you're using, whatever, you can look into Cirrus Health and then um, Bluestream has a free um, video consultation one thing going. So those are the things we have for you. And then now we will, I will start answering the questions. So let's see, Jill. First question 
<clears throat> How do we bill for time when we coordinate care with providers for patients in time when time is over 25 minutes? Say time equals two hours. I, and then they'd have to give me an example of a code. So I don't, I can't, I can't answer that. Um, I can simply say we know we have prolonged care codes that are available for use with our office visit codes, our 99213s. Um, I have not seen, because the telephone call codes, the 99441 to 443 codes, um, have not previously been payable by Medicare. They're not on the CCI edit list to tell me if I could use a prolonged care code with those codes. So um, I would say at this time, not knowing what code you're talking about, I would just give the blanket statement of our traditional ENMs, the 99201 to 215, those codes have prolonged care possibilities. Okay. If we draw labs in our clinic on one day, then do a telemedicine office visit the next day, what do we do if the patient needs a prolia shot? Also, if the office visit needs a modifier 25, do we put the modifier 25 first or the 95 first? Does the order matter? Okay, order always matters. You have to know you have payment modifiers and you have informational modifiers. So 25, and, and if I heard you correctly, you said they're gonna draw labs one day, see the patient, the next day? Yes. And then do a shot another day? Right. So there's, there's no need for a 25 modifier because you don't have any of those services on the same day. Um, but in general, a 25 modifier is more of a payment modifier, whereas a 95 is more informational, or at least that's how it's been traditionally, until I see it in writing differently. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the best I've got on that one. Okay, can the doc charge for telemedicine if the call is being facilitated by a visiting nurse? Or let home health submit their billing? And normally you cannot have a home health visit and a doc visit on the same day. Okay. Um, when they say that the home health person's facilitating, if we're using their smartphone and they're not really a part of the service, I don't see why that would be a problem. Um, I, I guess I'm not understanding the question. I understand what they're saying, but um, I think in this relaxed environment, if you've got a home health person there, as the phrase that they use was facilitating the call, then I think all they're there to do is to help. So um, it's a technical question. I think, you know, document the heck out of what's going on is the best I can say. Okay. Um, okay, under normal circumstances, do we have to protect PHI even if it poses an imminent threat to the greater society? No, that's exactly what I said. It, that's when we don't have to protect PHI. Okay. And I think that was on the bottom of that, that one slide. Um, okay. Um, what about when we're reviewing an, an MRI review? And I must, that one popped up while we were going over the, um, the result codes or the call codes. <laughs> yeah. And to me, I take it that any, if it's, if all you're doing is re giving test results, then you can't charge for an e &M visit, like visit. Right, remember, remember we, we try to pigeonhole things sometimes or we try to make absolute rules. I can give, um, I can see a provider giving um, MRI results to a patient and it's, it's a nothing. And I can see a physician give an MRI results to a patient and, and it is um, an E&M service. It depends on what they're doing. If I, if I call and say, hey, Mr. Jones, you don't have pneumonia, you're great, that's nothing. But if I call and say, hey, Mr. Jones, you do have pneumonia and here's what we're gonna need to do, then that turns into an office visit. I mean, you can sort of see that there's work involved. 
So it's not, you know, I'm looking at a question here that says, what about MRI review? Okay, what about it? Uh, you know, I need more information. There's no absolute that reviewing an x-ray, reviewing labs is or isn't a service. It's all about what's in the documentation and what did the doctor do? Did the doctor do work? Did he do an evaluation and a management portion of it? Okay. All right. Um, is online communication billable if it evaluates symptoms and goes on to recommend a telemed or office visit? Um, I would say yes, but again, it it, we've got to make sure the documentation is walking us through that. So you have, you know, the the patient emails the doc and the doc tells them, let's try this, let's try that. No, nope, that's not working. Okay, we're going to need to, to quote, take a look at you um, and do that telemed service. So I, I, I think that certainly could be, but again, we got to connect the dots in the documentation. Um, okay. On yeah. slide 72, online digital evaluation, we family medicine physicians are receiving a lot of my chart messages. How would you recommend informing patients that they will be charged for this service? Um, and, and I don't know your system and I know it becomes cumbersome. I mean, you can certainly as a provider do informed consent and, but you could also make it a very static statement that um, whatever they're doing that's getting that message to come to you precipitates a message back to them that says something to the effect of, you know, in this um, um, uh, emergency, what do we call it, PHE emergency, that, you know, there are charges for services like this, and then let them respond with the yes. Um, I think it's a delicate scenario. I had the question, a question the other day about how do we inform patients over here. It's, it just has to be something that you make a policy about and here's what we're going to do and then just do your best to stick to it. Um, if you look at the reimbursement for some of those services, their potential copay is not that much. And if you know you're going to be billing a static code like that G2012, you can even say this is going to have this much of a copay. But um, a well-worded policy, a well-worded statement to the patient, um, and, and people are going to complain no matter what, but I think the vast majority of people would much rather communicate um, one of these alternate virtual means and stay at home than to take the chance in coming out. Okay. What is considered audio only? Is that telephone on only or is it different? No, um, audio is whatever methodology you're using to get an audio conversation. Um, I know that some of the platforms for portals have audio and visual capabilities. So that's why we sort of use the words audio and visual as opposed to just necessarily telephone. Okay. Um, has, CMS, has CMS made comments about how likely they are to revert all the rules after the public health emergency closes? Um, I would say yes, because they, in many of the policies say until the public health emergency is over, or I think I saw one document, it might have been a private insurance insurer that said, you know, two weeks after the PHE is declared over. So yeah, they're going to, and it'll be putting a genie back in a bottle, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, can my office tech answer patient questions on the phone? And after speaking with the doctor, give med orders and instructions per the doctor, and then bill for this service. Can we bill for the phone call even if the doctor never directly spoke with the patient? I think you know the answer to that. Absolutely not. Sorry. Yep. Um, I, know, I, I know you're probably being asked to ask that question. Yes, <laughs> yes. So... I noticed that the Blue Cross Blue Shield rules wanted the place of service of O2 instead of the place of service 11. I'm a physician who has opted out of Medicare. Patients submit my super bill to their private insurance for out-of-network coverage. Which modifier should I use? 
I would say that you would you would still follow the same rules and and remember that Blue Cross Blue Shield document you saw was from Michigan only. Um, but when it comes to Medicare, I've not seen anything that has said that physicians that have opted out follow any different rules than what the rest of us are following. Okay. Um, does a caregiver nursing concern about a patient be eligible to initiate a telemedicine visit? <clears throat> I would I would say absolutely yes. That would it would um, make a patient eligible to come in to see the doctor if someone was concerned. Yep. Um, my office does not have visual. We have been doing all just audio phone. Are we not allowed to use the nine nine two one three code? You are not allowed to use that code for Medicare patients and for your other carriers. It depends on what they allow. Remember, we looked at. Texas Blue Cross says it's okay to do just audio. Michigan Medicaid says it's okay to just do audio. So Medicare, we know for sure as of today. The other insurances, we don't know the answer to that. You have to research that. Are you saying that when labs or imaging are reviewed and it is discussed on the audio visual call, the next course of action or options where do we go from here type of thing that we are unable to bill for a nine nine two one three four five whatever <clears throat> no that is not what i said um i said that you have to perform an e and m service and the where do we go from here type thing to me is you're telling me that is your assessment and plan so you would potentially meet that definition of providing the service based on your documentation. Okay, I have patients who have tested positive for COVID-19 in households in which other family members subsequently develop symptoms. These family members do not want to leave the house just to be tested. Am I able to say they have COVID-19 without a positive test, or do I use the code for exposure only? If you are a provider, it is your call. Okay. Um, since 99441 to 99443 are not telemedicine codes, how sh should claim be submitted with or without modifier 95? You submit it with the place of service that the service was provided for by the clinician and no modifier is needed because it's not a telehealth, telemedicine telehealth service. Okay. Um, just to clarify, we are not using CR, DR, et cetera modifiers. Are CS modifiers payer specific? Well, the CR and the DR, I know are the disaster ones. I don't know what the CSs are. So I apologize, Mr. Weaver. I would need more information. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I had a patient diagnosed with MRI brain mass yesterday and reported to me by the radiologist. Then I had to call the neurologist and his wife. Is, is this not an e and m and time took two hours all was done by phone call not video also patients had requested i notify their oncologist and dermatologist okay um <laughs> i would say hold on to this one i don't know what insurance they have so that's always the question what insurance do they have can we can we bill this? Um, it sounds to me that if you were able to bill based on counseling and coordination of care, you could accommodate the two hours. That would require you to bill an E&M type code, which would mean you'd have to use a telemedicine concept, which means you'd have to have a payer that was willing to take telephone only for that. And, and so I'm assuming you're a provider, so I got to back up because I just talked my way backwards into that and that you probably didn't follow. Um, you said you had to call the neurologist and his wife. Uh, the neurologist and his wife. 
patient had, okay. Who, I guess, who is the neurologist and his wife? Is he the patient? Cindy, can you help me on this one? I, I think it's that after he got the results from the radiologist, the doctor then contacted the neurologist to talk about the patient's care, then his wife. And then oh, after okay. that, once I, he talked to them, then he had also had to call the oncologist and the dermatologist. Okay, thank you. I got sideways. Um, I would say look in your, these holes, have someone in your office pull up the non-face-to-face -face prolonged care time codes and have them copy off the instructions for use of those codes and have you read that with the time you spent in mind and see if any of that time, any of that two hours spent would meet the requirement of non-face-to-face -face prolonged service time. Because basically that's a code that's intended to be used for time spent in something that either will be used or has been used with regard to the patient. And I think that you might be able to fit into that. I'm sorry, I can't think of the code number, but it's not prolonged service, but it's non-face-to-face -face prolonged service. Okay, for E&M coding, five to 10 minutes, et cetera, includes actual face-to-face -face with patient and time for documentation in the chart? Um, it's face-to-face -face time with the patient, and if you're documenting in front of the patient, it counts, but it would it's all face-to-face -face time in the office. Okay. Are the new patient E&M codes 99201 to 5 payable from here on going forward or only during the epidem epidemic? My guess is it's only during the PHE, but we don't know that in. We don't know. Okay. Um, I heard you can't use telemedicine two days in a row. You have to wait a week. Is that true? Well, that's that's probably the restrictions that you're thinking of for the 99441 code that says um, not related to an E&M service something. But um, again, the feel on the phone call from CMS yesterday and go to CMS website and um, either listen to it or look at the transcript is they, in essence, talked about relaxing that because the question was asked about a service provided in the hospital telemedicine two days in a row because remember we we had that slide that says for um, hospital visits you could only visit the patient every three days and they lifted that so um i've heard twice people say you have to wait a week i'm not sure where that's coming from unless it comes from that it couldn't be related to an e&m service within the seven, you know, within seven days after, but um, I, I'm I'm not sure if um, Kevin, if you're still on the line, if you type in what CPT code you're talking about billing two days in a row. Okay, let's see. And I'm seeing questions, by the way, Cindy. In case you haven't figured it out. Oh, wait, where'd that one go? Oh, that um, took care of. Okay. Yeah. Um. I was going to say, Kevin, if you're still on the line, you can't use telemedicine two days in a row. It just, it, I don't know what code you're talking about because there's so many codes in the telemedicine um, thing. If you're talking, we'll, we'll hypothetical it here. If you're talking about using the office visits, the 99201 to 215, I've not seen or heard of restrictions. Um, I think some people <laughs> are taking of, that um that's seven day and thinking that if they saw the patient seven days previously or i think that's where some of the confusion is okay um and and that's what they said that they weren't really enforcing on the call again nothing official um but Again, let's wait till there's a transcript out. And if there's a transcript that says they're not really enforcing it, I'm good with that. Okay. And then um, looks like Dr. Landers just said, yeah, I saw that earlier. 
um, United Healthcare said that that you can United Healthcare is another insurance that's just allowing I'm sorry that is allowing just audio for the 99201 to 215 codes. Yeah. So other insurances are falling in line. Let's cross our fingers yeah. that Medicare does. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Landers. I appreciate that. Yeah, so we have a few more that Oof. come in in the chat box. So, um, which modifier is used when the patient is in their home and the doctor in, is in his home? A modifier in place of service. Okay. So, although they told us early on that doctors had to register their home addresses, um, they've clarified that they do not. And um, one um, conference call that I was on said that the doctors can use their place of service office in box 32, even though they're home. And then today, um, the person said they can use either their home address, even though it's not registered, and, or use their office address for their place of service. Um, if and, I, and I'm sorry, I got lost in the middle of that question. So let me go back and see if I can see it. That was doctor, patients at their home and the doctor patients is in the, yeah. his home. Yep. So if, and again, we have to, I need to know what code you're billing. I'm going to make an assumption. It's an E and M code. So it's a 99201 to 99215. So you're doing telemedicine service and you're doing audio and visual to a Medicare patient, then you would bill office place of service if that's normal for you, even though you're at home, and the modifier would be 95. If it's another insurance, it could be a different convolution. Okay. If you look at the Blue Cross Blue Shield grid at the end of the lecture that has the colors on it, you can see that they've got it a little different. If they have United Healthcare, we just found out United Healthcare will cover it if it's a telephone call only. So that's why, you know, as I said, things are changing and they're changing as we go. So thanks, Sin. Okay, how do we document the time? Currently we document X minutes of a total of X minute face-to-face -face with spend counseling and coordinating for the following diagnoses. Okay, um, well, it depends on what code. So if we're talking about time, as I called it, the new time, where you're doing just total time of the visit, I would document total time of the visit was this. Um, or if you're in an EHR where you put start and stop times in, that would enter end up with total time in the documentation. If we're talking about codes that have like a five to 10 minute um, descriptor, a documentation that I, you know, I spent six minutes on this visit, it meets the minimum threshold, I think would be good enough. So we don't have any special directions for start and stop time. We don't have any special direction for um, anything else with regard to time and, and not even with the new time with the 2021 directive. We don't have any, re any requirements that I've seen on how to document that other than to make sure it's in the documentation. Okay. Um, is reimbursement the same whether physician is sitting in his home or in his office during the audiovisual televisit? No, it's not. He could be sitting in his car potentially, okay. but we won't even go there because then what, what would the address be? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then someone said they like the way you organize slide 69. You asked them to tell you, so. Um, oh, thank you. Are the new patient EM codes payable from here? We already answered that one. Um, Okay, if during the telemedicine yeah. conference, the provider determines need for in-person evaluation, how does that get billed? As long as it's not the same day, it gets billed just the way you normally would. So you bill the telemedicine. So it's a 992, if we're talking Medicare, it's a 99213 place of service office with a 95 modifier. They come into the office the next day. It's a 99213 place of service office with no modifier. Okay. How about if physician calls the patient to discuss lab results and radiology reports? Can that be billed as a G2012? 
as long as it meets the definition of the code, does it need to have any evaluative components or is it just a quickie? And I apologize, I don't have that slide right up in front of me. Um, one second. <laughs> I'm going to flip some slides while you okay. will do another question while I flip some slides. All right. Um, when billing for time, are we billing based on current time specified by CMS or new time amounts coming in 221? It would be what's, what's current now. That's what you billed for. Don't get ahead of ourselves with 21. Okay. So the question about the G2012, it says, it says a brief communication, virtual check-in, um, who can report e &M service, providers for establishment, not relating to brief communication. That's all it says. Yep. Five to 10 minutes of discussion. So if the physician calls the patient to discuss lab results and radiology reports, um, again, it's me is it medically necessary to give those reports? Um, it sounds like it certainly could be. It's a brief communication. Certainly sounds like it could be. Because remember, this one says, and I get my little pointer here. This one says brief communication here, whereas our other codes say evaluation and management. This one doesn't say that. So I think you would probably be okay on that one to build the GO212. That's a good question. Good job on that one. Thank you. Okay, and um, actually someone came back and said that the full telemedicine visits don't have the seven-day, 24-hour limitations. Only telephone visits and the virtual check-ins have that. So when was someone okay. was saying that you couldn't do it, you had to wait a week. That's what that was about. Um, all right, we got to clarify. Can you go over when we use O2 as the place of service? Um, if for Medicare, never, <laughs> um, for other insurances, if they want it, remembering if you use O2 for Medicare and you're a regular doctor's office, you're going to be paid less than you would because of that place of service. So you, your instructions are to bill from the place of service where you would normally perform the service. So if it's 11 because you're in the office, if it's, and I think it's 22 is provider-based billing, um, you bill those telemedicine visits, those 99201 to 99215, you bill them with the normal place you bill, but the modifier 95 tells them it was a telemedicine visit. Otherwise, you're going to see a decrease in payment. Okay. Um, okay. Dr. Lander came back with, I am wondering every day I will be having follow-up care with my patient who has diagnosis with a brain mass and has surgery tomorrow. The telephone minutes will be greater than 25 minutes in a seven-day period. Or should I wait till the end of the week and document time as an extended 99354 and 99355? which I think are those extended codes. Hmm. It would appear to me that if during the week you said you're spending that much time on any given day, you might have meet, met the threshold for one of the other codes. Yeah, yeah that's a prolonged service one, so, yep. Okay, um, I think we already answered the Payment modifiers go before the informational modifiers. Um, as far as CEUs, um, now I asked for AAPC and they were not willing to give it unless we charged for it. So um, if caregivers nursing gave information on dementia <laughs> patients in nursing home, will that be a billable telemedicine service? No, not if, if, if there's no interaction with the patient, um, it has to be an interaction with the caregiver at a minimum, at a, at a, at a decision maker, not a caregiver, sorry. Um, 
And for telemedicine, that's a slippery slope. So, yeah, someone that just works there, I don't think that would meet the threshold. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then there was, I think, um, there's one more question. If you're familiar with the Z71.2 and Z76.89, Diagnosis codes. All right. <laughs> All right. They're probably. Hold on. Let's go back. Hope nobody gets car sick. <laughs> I can't slide it. I'm sorry. Let's see. So it's a billable ICD code used to specify a diagnosis of person consulting for explanation of examination or test findings. Jeepers. Okay, so that's not anything to do with this. Oh, no. um, yeah. You I, know, um, Doc, I would say um, email me and I'll look it up and I can email you back. <laughs> email Cindy, she'll send it through to me and I'll, I'll send it back. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Well, I think we covered everything that came through. Um, Jill, thank you for wonderful presentation again. Thank you all for um, joining us. Um, again, if you have questions, please send them into physician services at osteopathic.org. Um, if I can't get them, I send them on to Jill and we uh, will have her take care of them. Um, the handouts are PDFs that are available in the course on the AOA Online Learning. Um, I know someone said they had trouble downloading. I just tried it and I was able to download. So I don't know if there were too many people going at once or if there was something on the specific person's system, but um, please try to download them again. Um, and then and Cindy, I'm gonna send you a, Cindy, I'm gonna send you an updated copy because we added some stuff that I thought okay. it was unfair they didn't see it, so. That's fine. That's Sorry to great. interrupt. No problem, appreciate that. Um, and the recording will be up there tomorrow with the updated slides as well. So thank you all. Remember to go back to AOA Online Learning to take your post-evaluation so that you can get your CME. Thank you much. And again, Jill, thanks so much. This concludes our webinar.